February 2024 marks 20 years since we first celebrated LGBT History Month, which was founded by Schools Out co-chairs Paul Patrick and Sue Sanders following the repeal of Section 28 of the Local Government Act 1988. This year's theme recognises the historic and recent contributions of LGBT people to the field of medicine and healthcare. But before we get into that, what was Section 28 of the Local Government Act and what is the significance of it being repealed? To answer that, we need to rewind back to 1983, when a storybook written for children by Danish author Susan Bosch was published in English in 1986 and found in the library of the Inner London Education Authority. The book entitled Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin was written after Bosch became aware that there were many same-sex couples living in Denmark and that there was a need for a book with which these children could identify. The discovery of its English publication generated significant media interest, so much so that by 1987, then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher stated in a speech at the Conservative Party conference that children were being cheated of a sound start in life due to being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. By 1988, material provisions of what would become Section 28 of the Local Government Act would read as follows. Under Section 1, it stated that a local authority shall not a. promote or publish material with the intent of promoting homosexuality and b. promote the teaching in any maintained school of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretend relationship. Needless to say, Section 28 was met with large protests from the LGBT community, including the disruption of a live news broadcast by lesbian activists and a debate on BBC Radio, in which Sir Ian McKellen, concerned about its effect on the arts and fearing for its implications on a wider scale, questions the purpose and the logic of the bill, subsequently and inadvertently coming out over the airwaves at age 48. Fast forward 15 years and the UK government would repeal Section 28 under the Local Government Act 2003. Since then there have been several legislative flashpoints and steps towards equality for the LGBT community in the UK, including the Sexual Offences Act of 2000, the Civil Partnership Act of 2004 and the Marriage or Same-Sex Couples Act of 2013. Lastly, the government's 2018 LGBT Action Plan committed to bringing forward proposals that would end the practice of conversion therapy in the UK. Conversion therapy being a type of practice designed to cure an individual of being LGBT. This brings us nicely to the present day, where LGBT History Month is celebrating its 20th anniversary, recognising contributions to the field of medicine and healthcare. But just before I share my picks, I'd like to tell you about the people that made this video possible. The Diversity Trust is a non-profit social business, on a mission to influence social change that creates a fairer and safer society. Their award-winning director, researcher and activist, Barclay Wilde, has over three decades of experience delivering diversity, equity and inclusion training across all protected characteristics. The Diversity Trust are committed to using their experience, platforms and training to amplify the voices of marginalised communities. Their training covers everything from cultural competence, gender and hate crime awareness, unconscious bias and diversity in practice which specifically helps organisations to improve their working relationship with lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender communities. If you belong to an organisation that wants to take steps towards having more accessible conversations about the experience of your employees from diverse backgrounds, get in touch today by visiting diversitytrust.org. UK. And now it's time for my top picks of LGBT contributors to the field of medicine and healthcare. Born in Hastings in 1840, Sophie Jex Blake was a leading campaigner for allowing women to study medicine. Initially, she was met with resistance on both sides of the Atlantic, first being refused entry to the Harvard Medical School in 1867, and then from the University of Edinburgh in 1869 because apparently the university was not willing to make the necessary arrangements in the interest of just one lady. Later that year, a second application was made by her and six of the women that would become known as the Edinburgh Seven. This second application was approved and the University of Edinburgh became the first British university to admit women. Although this definitely represented a step forward for the times, it's an understatement to suggest that the environment these women had to study in was anything but hostile. This hostility peaked at the Surgeons Hall riot of 1870. It involved an angry mob hurling mud, rubbish and insults at the women during a medical exam. A combination of the riot making national headlines along with influential faculty members pushing for a ruling that women should never have been allowed on the course in the first place meant that the Edinburgh Number seven had their places at the university and degrees withdrawn. Forced to look further afield in pursuit of a medical education, Sophie would go on to pass her medical exams at the University of Bern and the King and Queen's College of Physicians in Ireland. In 1879, she returned to Edinburgh, becoming Scotland's first female doctor. Here she would establish what would become Scotland's first hospital to be staffed entirely by women. A lesbian and a feminist, Dr. Sarah Josephine Baker was an instrumental force in the improvement of child and maternal health in the United States. Following the sudden death of her father from typhoid fever at age 16, Sarah chose to give up her scholarship at Vassar College to pursue a career in medicine and support her mother and family. Following her graduation, Sarah served her internship at the New England Hospital for Women and Children in Boston. 
Here she worked at an outpatient clinic serving some of the city's poorest residents. She developed a keen interest in the link between poverty and ill health, which led her to a commitment to social medicine that would shape the rest of her career. By 1907, Dr. Baker, now serving as Assistant Commissioner of Health, managed smallpox vaccination programs and sanitation issues, as well as the notorious case of Typhoid Mary. The cook who had unknowingly spread typhoid throughout the city while working in several New York households. Dr. Baker would eventually go on to be appointed the first director of the city's brand new Bureau of Child Hygiene. She developed programs on basic hygiene for immigrants living in slum neighborhoods alongside the Little Mothers League, which trained young girls who were responsible for the care of their siblings while their parents were out to work on the basics of infant care. She founded and served as president of the American Child Hygiene Association until 1917 and became the first woman to earn a doctorate in public health from the New York University School of Medicine. By the time Baker retired in 1923, New York had the lowest infant mortality rate of any American city. Born Laura Maud in 1915, Michael Dillon was the first trans man known to have undergone gender confirmation surgery. Following his graduation from Oxford in 1938, Dillon would work at a lab conducting brain research. While there, he would seek advice from Dr. George Foss, who had been experimenting with medical uses for testosterone, which had first been synthesized in 1935. Foss agreed to help Dillon on the condition that he consulted a psychiatrist before treatment. Unfortunately, the indiscretion of that psychiatrist led to him being outed as trans to his colleagues, and he was forced to relocate. Dillon's first book, entitled Self, is thought to be one of the first medical works discussing trans identity and transitioning, distinguishing it from homosexuality with which it was often conflated. In 1944, following a double mastectomy, Dylan legally changed his name to Lawrence Michael. He underwent a total of 13 surgeries over the course of four years, including what would be the world's first phalloplasty. After qualifying as a doctor in 1951, he joined the Merchant Navy as a surgeon. However, his six years of service in the Navy ended abruptly when journalists tracked him down and again outed him as a trans man. After taking refuge in India, he became became a Tibetan monk and wrote several books on Buddhism for an English audience. His literature laid out arguments for the medical treatment of those that were experiencing what would later be called gender incongruence, a term used to describe the mismatch between the sex assigned at birth and a person's identity. He discussed at length the failings of purely psychotherapeutic treatment endured by those striving to align body with mind. Glasgow born and Jamaican raised, Professor Kevin Fenton initially worked in public health as a government doctor in Lucia, Jamaica, and after studying at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, became a senior lecturer on HIV epidemiology and consultant epidemiologist at the NHS's Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre. Epidemiology being the branch of medicine that deals with the incidence, distribution and possible controls of disease. In 2005, Fenton moved to the US to work for the Centre of Disease Control, eventually rising to become the director of the National Centre for HIV and ST prevention. Under his leadership, he oversaw the rollout of hard-hitting campaigns such as Testing Makes Us Stronger, which specifically targeted the hardest-hit communities to take a stand against HIV. Since returning to the UK, Professor Fenton has served as Regional Director for London in the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities, as well as Public Health Advisor to the Mayor of London and the Greater London Authority. He has become known for his focus on supporting marginalised communities affected by the pandemic. Writing two reports in 2020, which upon review, led to recommendations that shaped an equitable response and subsequent outcomes for minority British communities. In 2021, Fenton ranked only second to Lewis Hamilton on the list of most influential Black Britons. He was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2022 and is the incumbent president of the Faculty of Public Health. Let me know in the comments section who else you think should be celebrated. And if you've gotten value from this video, don't forget to subscribe to join us on our mission as we continue to create content that makes the conversation about mental health, well-being, and inclusion more accessible.